Christina. So a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, but when I mean warm, uh, it's really warm. It's 45 degrees outside for Dubai. So thanks for participating in Pharma Synergy Outcome 2021 meeting. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, all the event team, Christina, Jane, uh, to arrange this organization in such difficult days and also gave me the opportunity to moderate the upcoming session. I wish I could join in person, uh, but due to the pandemic, we still have some uh, travel restrictions. So pandemic, uh, pandemic is still going on. Every day we have a different variant. Uh, today, we will not discuss which vaccine is better or which stocks we should invest, uh, but we will more uh, focus on the impact of uh, pandemic for pharma companies uh, from portfolio and BD strategies. Indeed, specifically, particularly in this session, we will focus on internationalization and go-to-market models. So first of all, let me introduce myself quickly, um, and then I will hand over uh, the stage to my colleagues for the presentation. So uh, I have been in the industry for 17 years, started my career uh, in Turkey as a Turkish origin, and uh, for the last nine years, I've been working for Sandoz in different locations and different responsibilities. I was in Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and now I'm back in Dubai again, and I'm heading the uh, BD activities for Middle East and Africa. And a few words about Sandoz. You know, Sandoz is a global generic company, a division of Novartis. Uh, we have approximately 1,000 molecules in our global uh, portfolio. Uh, covering all therapeutic areas and uh, biosimilars as well. And we have an, uh, approximately around uh, $10 billion uh, dollars, uh, turnover globally. So today we have uh, three experts to share their view on internationalization and go-to-market strategies. Uh, we will start with uh, Joa. Uh, Joa is joining from Chanel, and uh, before Chanel, he worked for Blue Pharma and uh, Fresenius, uh, all for uh, BD, uh, BD roles. I will pass to uh, Joa uh, to have a quick introduction of himself. And before he starts, I also start with a, uh, with a question. Uh, so can you please tell us what are the main approaches for interna internationalization? and how pharma companies could execute those approaches in their strategy. And what is, what is Chanel's strategy? Uh, we will appreciate your view. Over to you, Joa. Uh, the panel, it's a pleasure to divide the panel with all of you. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, in terms of, the, of my own presentation, so as you referred, I work in Blue Pharma. I started, so all my career was made on the licensing perspective. Uh, both sides of the barricade, initially in out-licensing, then move to in-licensing in the Fresenius Cabi environment, so it couldn't be more different, a small, medium-sized company, a multinational company, and now back to a, to a small, medium-sized company on out-licensing again. So it's been an interesting journey over the last few years, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know why um, I'm presenting in here the licensing as, as, a, as, a, as an effective uh, internationalization strategy. Also on my own background, I'm, I'm divided between the scientific and the economic, so I'm a pharmacist by, by my first degree was in uh, pharmaceutical sciences, but then I specialized and I did an master, another master in international economics, especially on the internationalization of the pharmaceutical industry, so it's, it's really good to be here and to be able to speak about this, this topic. So as, as briefly on the, um, on the agenda, so I'll go very uh, shortly, and I'll speak a little bit about the, int the introduction of the internationalization in the pharmaceutical industry space. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the theoretical approach without being too boring, but I think it's interesting that we all do internationalization in our day-to-day -day, uh, activities, and it's interesting to look at it from a theoretical approach and to see how does that actually um, comes to, to practicality in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'll also talk about our, our example in, um, in Chanel and how licensing is really this, um, this strategy. So in terms of the introduction, so we all know that the, um, the globalization, it's a, it's a worldwide um, phenomenon, um, especially during the last years and especially in the, in the latest, in the last century with the entrance of, the, of China 
to the WTO organization. Uh, there was a complete new set of, of, of globalization and pharmaceutical industry was definitely one of them. Um, also, we all know that the pharmaceutical industry has a very relevant um, on, the, on the worldwide market, not just in terms of the size of the market, but especially because uh, for all reasons, the pharmaceutical industry has uh, something to say in terms of the well-being of the world, of extending the people's lives and the quality of life of everyone across the industry. So with this, there comes a lot of specific cities that are very uh, unique of the pharmaceutical sector. And this, of course, creates a completely different background when it comes to internationalization uh, of the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, some of these specificities, they actually started way before we thought. Uh, in the 1500s, uh, with, um, with a few legislation coming, uh, which for the first time recognizes drugs and the concept of drugs. Um, the creation of the World Health Organization, of course. Uh, the fellow myth strategy that we all know uh, very well and that were, was a game changer for everything uh, that comes uh, in terms of the regulation and therefore the internationalization strategies. And then especially in the US and Europe, there were a lot of regulations um, during the last two centuries, and I'll speak a little bit about a couple of them that actually impacted the internationalization of the companies uh, in, the last, in the last centuries. In any case, and as a starting point, I think we can all agree that the internationalization in the pharmaceutical uh, sector is complex, is expensive, uh, but above all, it's a very time-consuming process, and so it's important that the companies have a strategy defined when they decide to go outside and to grow abroad to extend their, their business. So in terms of the legislation and regulation that impacted the internationalization, so the majority of those um, was actually created before the 1980s. A lot of them as a reply to the Talidomid strategy. It's, it's, it's in these um, uh, 18 years, let's say, or especially in the latest 13 years of the, of before 1980 that a lot of the changes happened in the industry with the creation of the concept of generics, with the creation of the first legislation around the mutual recognition procedures in Europe. But then it's between the 80s and the 19 decades that um, especially um, in, the, in, the, in the US with the, concept, the, with the cre really creation of the generic concept and in Europe with the establishment of the European Medicines Agency and uh, the establishment of the first MRP and DCP procedures that really set up the basis of the internationalization from one day to the other everything in the industry was being recognized across countries. And as we can all imagine, this of course has a strong impact when the companies come to internationalize. internationalize. Um, after 20s uh, and in the latest 10 years, there has, there has been uh, pretty much some, some, some regulations. We all know about the serialization, of course, um, but also uh, in terms of the biosimilars, which is somehow mimetizing what happened in the previous decades, but also uh, opening these new areas for another uh, set of regulations that will be uh, very, very, very important in the future. So in terms of the internationalization theories, and this is what the, um, the economic people uh, tell us, there are mainly three uh, areas um, or three approaches to the internationalization. That is the first one, um, historically, it's, it's actually linked to the, to the Nordics economic school, uh, which is the behavioral approach, which means and which says that the companies and the firms tend to internationalize based on a rational approach. Um, I think it's funny to look at this when we all have been through the process, um, and it's actually interesting to see where one or the others apply or not. So basically what these guys tells us is that um, a firm will, so will start by operating in their own home markets, and then it will gradually expand into geographically closed markets, um, then in those geographically closed markets, they will tend to grow through a process. So they will start by uh, distributing, then they will change, they will create their own distribution channels, they will create their own manufacturing uh, channels, um, ending up with, with, uh, with almost home sales. That is a, a more recent approach to it, which is called the Aldi paradigm, also created in the last uh, century, which, which is probably more adapted to the, to, the, to the pharmaceutical industry, and I'll come to that, which tells us that basically the firms decide to internationalize and to move abroad, not based on geographical decisions, but mainly uh, based on a, con on, a, on a conjunction of advantages, and those advantages can be ownership advantages. We heard 
Um, we heard Juliana talking about it and Tanya as well in terms of the brands um, and even Mayank as well. Uh, there are location advantages and in the pharmaceutical industry are all used to hear about uh, countries that are that can manufacture products outside the patents, so this is a location, a location advantage. And then the internalization uh, advantages, which means basically that firms prefer to do business with their own rather than anyone else outside. Um, apart from this economic approach, there is also contemporary theories, uh, including the Born Global, the Network Theory, and the Strategy Choice Framework. The Born Global basically tells us that the companies nowadays, they born global, as, as, as the name says, uh, which is actually interesting as well in the pharmaceutical industry because we have seen a lot of R&D companies specifically that has born already with a, with a complete global perspective and not focused on, uh, on their own market. The network theory means that the, the companies tend to, to go for, for markets in which they have already some presence and some networks established. And the strategic choice framework is basically an evolution from the behavioral uh, approach. Okay, so what does happen on the pharmaceutical sector? And this is this was part of, of, of my own investigation uh, on the on the um, during my my thesis. And uh, basically, what what is very clear to everyone is that the internationalization is key to all pharmaceutical companies or to the big majority of the pharmaceutical companies. Actually, if you look at overall uh, every companies around 90% of the pharmaceutical companies have uh, internationalization as one of their main strategies. There isn't much evolution from the entry mode. And again, we can, we can see from the previous presentations in which uh, the markets that Asino is present, the markets that Manarini is present, they, did, they don't enter there with a distribution and then evolve to different uh, entry modes. They usually focus on those entry modes based on the kind of products, the kind of uh, companies that they are partnering with, so it means that people, and, and, and again, it goes against the behavioral approach that we discussed in the beginning, people, the, the companies don't tend to, to internationalize based on a certain progression, rather they focus on an entry mode that allows them to take the best out of each opportunity. There is some evidence as well that the entry mode is linked to the region, and again, we have saw some, some, some references uh, in the previous presentation, especially from Mayang, to the different uh, regulations that every country has and how does that impact the entry mode and the business model that they choose. So, and, and I, I, I can swear that I didn't align this with them, so it was actually just interesting that I was seeing the presentation and seeing some of the things that I was going to, to refer. And then we can also um, conclude that the internationalization cannot be explained by one single theory, but probably a combination of all, including the advantages paradigm that I was telling you, the born global, as I said, especially in the latest uh, in the latest cases, it has been very relevant, and the network theory. So, um, if we if we combine all these four uh, things, we can definitely assume that because of the regulations uh, and because of specificities of the pharmaceutical industry, the licensing can really um, be an effective uh, internationalization uh, strategy rather than an evolution point. So rather than companies looking at the, the licensing as a way to reach a certain level, the licensing can be a strategy by itself. And the case of Chanel, it's, it's a very good one. So um, just to, to give you a perspective, in the, in the previous years, we have actually changed our strategy. So uh, before we were, uh, we were exploring our own brands in some markets and then we were complementing it with licensing. And three, four years ago, we started and we decided to focus only on licensing. Um, we decreased the percentage of, of business that we were having with our own brands from 15% to pretty much nothing. Last year, 3%. Um, and, uh, and, and this is this is the graph that shows this. Of course, 2020, in 2021, we will start to see the asterisks uh, very often because that was a product mix related with the COVID. It was an increase on a product that was, that was very, very important for COVID. Otherwise, you clearly see the decreasing trend. And what we have achieved with this is that even though we were decreasing um, our business with our own brands, uh, we managed to increase the number of countries in which we entered. So we increased our internationalization degree, let's say, um, and we haven't, we have met, managed even to increase our turnover, even though uh, focusing on one specific segment, which is the, the licensing segment, as I said. Um, and why is the licensing a good strategy for uh, companies? There are two perspectives, uh, starting with 
the licensor perspective, um, it, it allows us to increase the geographical area of, of exercise. Um, especially in small companies, this is very relevant um, when, when you cannot create your own sales offices in, in, in all areas. It allows the companies to avoid blocking trades and quotas by transferring the production, for example. It allows us to be very focused and to decrease the costs on supportive, business supportive uh, areas. Um, the pharmacovigilance is one example, regulatory and things like that. And it allows the companies to actually take advantage of the network that the partners that exist in the several countries um, uh, without having that, that network. But there are also advantages from the in-licensing perspective. And when I say that the licensing is a, a very good strategy for internationalization, it's also, even if a company is present in several markets with their own brands, and that's their internationalization strategy, the licensing can still complement that offer uh, and, and can contribute to that, to that strategy by allowing the companies to focus on different areas. Um, so from one side, it reduces the time to market. We all know this. It's much easier to win license than to develop the product. Uh, it reduces the R&D risk. We all know this as well. And it also reduces the investment and allows the companies to focus that R&D investment in other areas, namely the promotion, the creation of the brands, and etc. It allows to, to explore potential market niches. Um, if a company is, is focused on 10 countries, uh, it would make sense and it wouldn't be able to develop products for each specific country, while by focusing on in-licensing, they can actually focus on niche opportunities for those markets. Um, it allows for better supply conditions over time. This is particularly relevant for small companies companies that are not global uh, companies or worldwide companies and that are focused on three or four markets in order to get scale on products, the in-licensing ends up being a much better strategy than developing and manufacturing the own product. Um, it also allows us to take advantages from the location. I refer to the, patents, uh, the patent situations and the possibility to produce products on all patent uh, countries. And of course, it also allows the companies to take advantage of the board globals, as I was saying, especially on the value-added medicines, we see more and more small companies bringing very good innovations to the market, and these and these companies don't have uh, or, or don't have on their strategy and don't have the capacity to actually um, to, to market their own products. So other companies that are present in several markets can take advantage from these innovation that the board globals are bringing. So all in all, uh, given the complex business environment that exists in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, definitely the licensing is an effective. Uh, uh, strategy for internationalization from both sides, from the in-licensing perspective and from the out-licensing perspective. And that's basically my conclusion to the presentation. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer the questions in the end. Thank you so much, Joa. Really appreciate it for the great presentation. So now the next uh, presenter will be Jan. Uh, from Abdi Ibrahim. Uh, so Jan uh, is joining virtually from Turkey. Uh, I mean, he had previously working for Amgen in BB again, uh, and now he's uh, leading the um, regulated markets uh, entering strategy in Abdi Ibrahim. So I also, Jan, I also worked for Abdi Ibrahim some time. So I know Abdi has uh, more than 100 uh, years of history. So can you please um, talk about uh, what is the uh, internationalization journey of Abdi Ibrahim? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jan, and thanks for the introduction, Rudvan. Uh, I started almost two years ago uh, at Abdi Ibrahim, and the internationalization journey of Abdi Ibrahim started almost like 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, before that, the company, and you will see that in my presentation, almost 100 years of not almost, a little bit over than 100 years of history, but uh, the internationalization started uh, 20 years ago and it was a very small steps, uh, which I call like baby steps uh, at that time. Uh, and then there were a mixed uh, hybrid model. Uh, there were some 
co-development, there were some distributors, there were some uh, out licensing in the whole process, but uh, it was mainly in the neighboring countries or the surrounding areas. But the big steps came in uh, after we had a joint venture in Algeria, after we had a joint venture in Kazakhstan. Uh, and then when we established the company in Europe and then moved forward. So it is overall 20 years. And uh, I think we came to a good uh, stage in our lives and we are now in fact, building up the next stages uh, in our internationalization or, um, you know, expansion strategy as company. Hello again, everyone. Uh, it seems as C-A-N, but uh, Rudvan knows this. He's J pronounced as J in Turkish, so it's John. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to give that uh, background. And on top of that, uh, I am a chemical engineer by uh, training, but uh, I never did a chemical engineering really that much. Uh, after chemical engineering, uh, I got my MBA and then uh, I got a master's also in international affairs, worked in the United States. States and then came to Turkey, worked in several companies, uh, including Zentiva and Sanofi. Uh, and uh, for the, the, the uh, currently I'm working at Abdi, uh, like Rudva mentioned, I'm head of the commercial operations on regulated markets and creating the golden market strategies, especially for the regulated markets. And uh, also having the out licensing activities for Abdi Brian uh, in these in these territories uh, that I just mentioned. So um, when. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about the company. Uh, it is a Abdi is a private company, and uh, internationalization is an important part, important uh, part of our strategy, expansion strategy. Uh, we have uh, based in Istanbul, and we have four thousand six hundred people, uh, and we do licensing products, we do out-licensed products, and also uh, we have uh, production facilities in three different locations in three different uh, countries. Uh, Istanbul is, of course, one of them, and then there's uh, Kazakhstan and there is Algeria. Uh, of the, let me go a little bit further. Uh, in its history, uh, and it's its formation uh, and with a history of 120 years, uh, it really believed in strong partnerships and uh, the company grew with its licensors and it grew uh, its current size uh, with its joint ventures. We even have joint ventures with uh, originator companies being the number one company in Turkey. Like for example, currently we have a joint venture with Otsuka uh, and Abdi Brahim and it's called under the umbrella of Abdi Brahim Otsuka and we sell Otsuka products in Turkey uh, with a dedicated Abdi group. And we are number one in our own uh, core CNS uh, area. So um, as a company, uh, in its genes, uh, Abdi really believes that uh, expansion and joint ventures really is the way to go uh, to learn, uh, to expand, and to which I call it a conquer. Uh, so that is why we give uh, during this pandemic times, uh, we never stop uh, our way of like moving forward or forward thinking and what we can do in order to reach our goals for 2025 and even uh, beyond further. Because, sorry. When you looked at our current structure, uh, still our main sales are coming, 82% uh, of sales coming from Turkish market, our domestic market, 13%, uh, and this is according to 2019. So right now it is roughly 15% from international markets and 5% contract manufacturing. So the whole journey of internationalization and go to market and new expansion started 
by looking at these numbers and saying that how can we change this structure uh, from 82% to 50% from Turkish market to 40% or uh, a little over 40% uh, to international markets and contract manufacturing will be around 10 to 15%. So we really wanted to uh, diversify the portfolio. We really wanted to diversify the territories. And uh, that's why we, uh, Abdi Brian pushed the button in order to change its structure, in order to change its portfolio, uh, and in order to see or get in more, uh, in the, uh, you know, like involved uh, with the new countries. And this also requires to change uh, or comes, I think, uh, go to market or new expansion, uh, new uh, territories uh, comes. And Ridwan also mentioned, like in Sundos, they have 1,000 molecules and they have a huge portfolio. And I think go to market or new expansion uh, requires a really strong portfolio and uh, really strong production uh, capabilities. Uh, we really believe that uh, also in Abdi Ibrahim. Uh, that's why we have uh, current capacities around 450 uh, million units, which we are adding exactly the same amount uh, in the upcoming two, three years. Uh, and also we produce pretty much uh, everything except the injectables uh, in our facility, uh, including the biosimilars. So these are the current structure uh, in Abdi Ibrahim. And we decided that this structure can change a little uh, in order to do the expansion according to our own needs, our own requirements. So that's why uh, we analyze the countries where we wanted to expand. We analyze the markets according to our portfolio, according to our own core competencies. And uh, we selected certain areas that we would uh, we can be more involved uh, or where we can create our own teams and start sale, uh, doing sales uh, under our own umbrella. Uh, and for example, with this strategy uh, in 2020, in fact, in the core of um, this whole uh, pandemic, uh, Abdi Ibrahim uh, bought uh, a 29% of stake uh, in a Swiss uh, specialty company, Om Pharma. Om Pharma was under the umbrella uh, of uh, V4 Group, and V4 Om Pharma got separated from uh, V4, and then Abdi Brahim uh, bought a stake of 29% on this one. Uh, it's a specialty company, uh, and uh, we believe that this will uh, give us a lot of capabilities, especially on biotechnology. And and in terms of like our expansion into Europe. Uh, I did not mention it in my slides, but starting from the January 2022, Abdi Brahim uh, will be started sales also uh, under the umbrella of Abdi Pharma uh, in Germany. Uh, we started our own uh, company, uh, registered the products, and Abdi Pharma Germany will be uh, operational starting from January 2022. Uh, and then two additional countries are coming in. Uh, for Europe, uh, and that will be done till 2025. Uh, so internationalization, we really believe that uh, finding the areas that you can believe you can contribute to your uh, own structure and also where you can utilize your own portfolio on uh, capabilities. Uh, so for us, um, I mean, for Abdi, uh, the growth drivers uh, were always uh, things that they really, or we really believe that we can be strong. Um, 
we are strong in our current portfolio. We were strong in domestic market in our domestic markets. So we believe that, uh, especially going towards 2025, uh, the international markets will definitely be a growth driver for Abdi, uh, as well as the biotechnology, the consumer health but in selected markets, not in every markets that we are uh, planning to expand. And also contract manufacturing, because contract manufacturing, uh, we are currently involved in with uh, a lot of the originator companies as their contract manufacturer in our domestic markets, even in, in some international markets or producing in international markets. And because of this reason, uh, we see this area as a growth driver as well. Um, for the internationalization process or for the go-to-market process, I really believe that every company needs to look inside first, identify uh, what are the things, capabilities that they can give or contribute to the areas or to the new markets that they can uh, go and move forward. And then after identifying, uh, identifying those areas, uh, then also choose the areas that they can move forward. And it does not have to be always uh, under uh, its own brand. I mean, under own, uh, its own structure. It can be through uh, distributors where we are expanding, especially to Europe uh, via distributors like Netherlands in UK. This is uh, an area that we believe we can be more strong uh, in these countries or by out licensing. I mean, uh, you know, uh, finding the right out licensing partner on certain products. Um, and because sometimes you cannot market the product uh, on your own really uh, effectively and you need to know where to do the out licensing and, you know, like believe in the partner uh, and so that you can make uh, most out of the product. So. Uh, internationalization, go-to-market, uh, I believe uh, is critical for the expansion, but also while doing that, uh, you really uh, need to focus on very strongly on your portfolio uh, and also the on your own uh, development. I think, uh, I mean, these are the things that we looked while we were creating our go-to-market strategy. And um, also depends, uh, uh, we learned also from our, our experience that uh, we make changes uh, in each country while we are looking for answers for these kind of questions or the requirements while creating our go-to-market strategies. Uh, but uh, I think the, this, questions even in uh, or RX or the OTC products uh, really give a good overview uh, of uh, creating the business case, especially for that specific country. I think uh, that's it, uh, Rudvan, from my end at this point uh, regarding the go-to-market uh, and for our growth drivers. Uh, if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer or uh, maybe I can answer it uh, afterwards. Uh, we will have the questions at the end, Jan. Thanks a lot for the uh, great presentation. I mean, I think Abdi is a good example for internationalization, and uh, I mean, it's a good good benchmark for for all the pharma companies. So now uh, uh, we will go to our next speaker, uh, Ekrem uh, Ekrem Turajlik from uh, Bosnalek. I mean, Bosnia is my favorite country, indeed, Ekrem. So I will leave the stage to you. So Ekrem has been working for uh, Bosnalek quite some time, and uh, he will also talk about um, go-to-market strategies in such a you know uh, high competition industry. I mean, after all these new companies, entries, new technologies, even with the pandemic challenges, it's definitely a, a red ocean now. So Ekrem, what's your view? What is the right strategy for go-to-market? Hi, Red One, and hello to everyone. First, thank you for the kind words about uh, our country. And also thanks to uh, Christina and to Jane for inviting me to speak and participate at the Pharma Synergy Conference here in Berlin. 
Uh, my name is Ekrem Trilic, uh, coming from company Bostonic. My educational background is in economics, and I have a postgraduate degree in uh, business administration. I've been with the company for almost 16 years in different uh, roles, uh, mostly related to international uh, business, marketing, sales, strategy formulation, and execution. My last uh, role was uh, head of corporate sales. Now I'm in the role of director of region Middle East, Africa, and Turkey. The role is somewhat uh, larger than that because uh, the region is somewhat larger than that because I'm involved or heading any expansion projects the company is doing, whether in the Far East Asia, Middle East Africa, the European Union, and the Americas. Uh, so before going further, just to uh, say that all the uh, ideas and opinions expressed in this presentation may not necessarily represent the views of my employer. Uh, Boston, I can brief uh, to tell you uh, what does the name of the company mean. Uh, Bosna is actually a uh, name of the river which flows from the capital Sarajevo to the north of the country and lake means medicine. Uh, in, we were established in 1951 at that time, uh, we were part of Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia had a, a state program for developing healthcare industry. So in each of the republics in that country, you used to have producers, whether of uh, pharmaceuticals, whether of medical equipment, uh, consumables, and we were at that time the only company in Bosnia producing medicines. Till 1991, we were uh, mainly producing licensed products for international companies, namely Sanofi, Astra and uh, uh, other companies which later were acquired by big pharma international companies that no longer exist. Uh, in the first part of the 90s, uh, we became an independent country and that time the, the, the country itself ran through some troubles. So these licensing agreements ended and uh, we were only focusing on the local market. Why we were doing these licensing agreements mostly was uh, for uh, uh, serving the markets of the former Soviet Union because at that time you had a division between East and West Bloc so Yugoslavia served as sort of a, a bypass and uh, back channel for the companies from the West to enter the markets of the former Soviet Union. Uh, today we are a leading uh, pharmaceutical company from Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, and it's a privately owned company with more than five and a half thousand shareholders uh, we are present in 24 countries and we have a 850 plus staff. Uh, not represented today, but not surprisingly for our industry, almost 60% uh, uh, of managerial positions are held by women. Uh, we possess all the relevant, relevant international standards for producing uh, uh, pharmaceutical products, namely the EU GMP, and next year we expect to be US FDA certified. Uh, for a company of our size, uh, it's not always the case, but we have our own research and development, and most of the products from our portfolio come from this uh, uh, facility. Uh, in this portfolio, we have 220 products consisting of medicines, food supplements, medical devices, uh, specially used cosmetics, and disinfectants. Uh, Ten brands generate about 70% of the sales of the company. Uh, and most of our revenue, actually more than 75%, is generated from international uh, operations. We uh, have Russian Federation as the largest market for us. When we were returning to international expansion in, in uh, 20 years ago, uh, the question at that time that was asked is where to return, to which markets to go back. And of course, this map shows here that we return to the traditional markets where we had a reputation for producing high quality medicines uh, and that's countries of the former Soviet Union again, the CIS, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, all the, almost all the countries which, which earlier belonged to the uh, Soviet Union and to countries of the Southeast Europe, the former Yugoslavia, including Albania. Uh, in the last couple of years, after expanding our uh, capacity and uh, uh, updating our portfolio, we also to started to expand to other countries. So the blue countries represent where we are present in this moment. Uh, in addition to traditional markets, we are now also present in Germany uh, and in Middle East and African countries like uh, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, and next year we also will be present in Turkey. The purple colored countries represent uh, countries where we have started 
registration process, or it will be started within the next six to 12 months. Uh, and the green con uh, color countries represent those countries where we either sign the CDA or we are having some uh, deeper exploration of the opportunities about which portfolio to go to with these products. Uh, about strategic opportunities uh, that every company is facing and to stay in business and uh, keep our uh, competitive edge, each company has uh, dilemmas how to grow. And in theory, if we look, we have the uh, ANSAF matrix, which shows uh, different oppor strategic opportunities for growth. Uh, so all of them have different risks related to them. Uh, the first one, or the easiest one, which we usually do is the market penetration. We go to the market with the, ex with the with, to our existing markets with the existing products. Here we uh, increase uh, or uh, increase our distribution promotional activities. Within this strategy also can be introducing new channels of communication across the industries. Uh, the digital has proven to be uh, a, a groundbreaker and a new uh, channel of communication to expand our reach and potential. Uh, in the uh, new products, in the product development, we go to the existing market with the new products. Here the risk is how to bring those new products to the, to the market. We should know our market well, but how to bring these products it can be either through our own research and development, uh, through in licensing or through uh, contract manufacturing uh, and transfer of technology. Uh, here, since we do our own R&D, sometimes when we introduce the products, the dilemma is whether we go with our own products or with the in licensing products. When we go with our own R&D products, in this case, the dilemma is whether we will be on budget in the terms of development, whether we will launch the product in time, and also when we actually do launch it, whether we will be able to produce it efficiently at a price that will justify the investment. Uh, the scope of my presentation today, and basically the scope of my work in general in the company is about going to new markets with the existing products. That is the geographic expansion to new territories. Uh, here, uh, we, we when we go to such markets, the issues that we will be facing, I will talk a bit about that later. And in diversification, we go to new markets with new products. And being in the pharma industry and using the pharmacy uh, channel for, for sales, it was a natural step for us to introduce food supplements and medical devices in the portfolio. We went also a step further and bought shares in a company which is producing food supplements to gain access to their uh, knowledge about uh, this category of products to merge and make synergies with, uh, with their knowledge of, of this category. Uh, I liked draws uh, international, internationalization theories earlier and uh, how he has framed about uh, w where the companies, uh, in which way the companies go international. And when we go international, the dilemma is uh, where to go. Two slides ago, perhaps when you saw the map, uh, everybody thought to him or herself that there, are, there might be better opportunities in some place else. Uh, however, we all face the same issues, whether the economic indicators suggest that it's a good market to go to, uh, not only politically, economically, and socially, but also in terms of the security. In some of the places in which I'm working with, there's also issues of security. Uh, what are the regulatory requirements, whether our company or our dossiers uh, comply with the regulatory requirements of that territory? Coming from uh, Europe, Europe uh, being in the climate zone too, when we wanted to expand to the Middle East countries and the Far East Asia, we faced the challenge of having to conform to the stability studies for climate zone 4A or 4B in the case. Uh, so we had to make investments into the uh, capacity in terms of the chambers that follow the studies. Uh, what are the therapeutic guidelines in these uh, territories? Are they any different from our country also? In terms of the strength of the product, for example, we may have a two milligram strength of a product, but in that territory they use four milligrams and we don't have it. Uh, also, is the product which we are launching under patent? Is there t trademark protection? Whether we will be use our whether we will be be able to use our brand and leverage on this brand? Uh, is there availability of market data? In some places, it's very hard to find credible uh, data, and you doubt the integrity of it. Uh, whether there are multinationals or local producers in the market uh, that are dominating it. Uh, what are the market dynamics in terms of the prescription? Is it prescription by generic name, by the brand name? 
are prices regulated uh, uh, for just for uh, prescription medicines and also for the OTCs? Uh, are pharmacy chains dominant? And is there many or few pharmaceutical distributors? And in the end, the logistics, how are we going to supply and serve this market? Uh, the healthcare landscape for uh, general is, is known. It all starts with the patient and all the stakeholders correlate with each other on uh, uh, solving the issues of the, that the uh, patients have. Uh, so uh, to, to reach to the market and to bring the treatment to the patients, it all starts with the portfolio. What portfolio will we bring into that market? So um, it starts first with the key success factors defined within the value proposition. Does our product have therapeutic efficacy in the treatment of the patient? Does it deliver positive health outcomes in terms of the, whether the benefits outweigh the risks associated with the usage of it? And can we make it affordable for the patient there to, to buy it? If these uh, answers are positive, then we, our product can deliver uh, benefits to the healthcare system in the country. And we go deeper into analysis of uh, the key financial measures. For example, uh, will the price be in line with the price strategy that we have for the, for the, for, for the company? Uh, can we reasonably produce it and have a margin not only for ourselves, but also to all the other ones who are in the, uh, included in the value chain, the distributor, the importer, uh, the pharmacy, the retailers? And can we supply the product and maintain supply considering the internal resources? If also this answer is positive, then we have a business case and uh, our product is not only then uh, a product but also a solution. What do we bring uh, along with our product? The knowledge about the, the, our product, the experience that we have in, treat, in, in using it as a, as a treatment, uh, promotional materials which we have designed and access to the me medical database, all the studies that we have done in the previous part. This is something like uh, Excel or Microsoft, sorry, su uh, suit. <laughs> You bring along all the solutions in PowerPoint or Excel, Word, and so on. Um, we have such product. Uh, it's based on lysozyme. Lysozyme is a natural substance occurring uh, in our uh, body. It's contained in our saliva, in our mucus, in our tears, in milk, and then skin our, uh, in the skin as well. It was discovered by Alexander Fleming. We all know this gentleman who discovered penicillin. Uh, he considered the discovery of lysozyme as his best scientific work. Uh, lysozyme is a product which we, we, we are the leading or we are the biggest uh, producer of lysozyme based products as Pharma Grade. We developed different uh, uh, ranges of these products consisting of uh, pastilles, oral sprays, nasal sprays, and also cream. So, uh, what we found with Lysobact that it has a lot of uh, beneficial features which distinguish it from all the other products being used in the sore throat uh, category. It has a more powerful antiseptic effect and many other beneficial effects, distinguishing it from other oral antiseptics existing in the market. So it has antimicrobial, analgesic, anesthetic, anti-inflammatory, pro-regenerative, mucoprotective, uh, immunomodulatory, anti-allergic, and anti-plague effects that the other products, or most of the, uh, that all the other products neither have any of them or they have some to some extent. So uh, we combine it in, in different forms, lysozyme and pyridoxine with cetylpyridine, uh, with cetylpyridine and lidocaine. And what we have found in uh, the numerous uh, uh, cases and in our experience, and even during the COVID times, that it has proved to be very efficient as a natural protection against uh, the viruses and uh, it, it's a natural uh, a cornerstone of immunity. So with all these benefits, our value proposition uh, is in the end, uh, 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 in the end so uh, diverse that uh, the Lysobact product, any of them which are being used, is not important whether it's a Lysobact pastel or oral spray, they have all shown to, have, to be efficient. And the price in the end, the value proposition is not the key, uh, 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 key success factor uh, in the decision of the buyer for the product. Uh, in the go-to-market strategy roadmap, uh, in the steps for, for the case to be successful, and a well-thought and holistic go-to-market strategy is really about building foundation 
for long-term success in the market. So uh, first, and I'm sure many of us had cases where we hear about great opportunities presented to us, but they haven't materialized. Uh, it's translating an opportunity to a strategy. And how do we do that is by establishing whether there's a credible uh, inputs by getting some uh, data from the market uh, about uh, the, the potential there. If there is a viable market opportunity, then we go deeper into making the market strategy. We have to define uh, with which portfolio to go to the market uh, and to make a sustainable business model. Uh, the third step would be to uh, how to price the product, whether all the, uh, uh, all the uh, involved stakeholders in the value chain will have a benefit. Uh, marketing and sales planning uh, in terms of making it, it more detailing and to uh, define uh, the sales targets. Uh, what is not always the case is syncing up with the internal stakeholders because adding new territories to the, to the work also incurs additional work. So in this case, uh, we have to have internal support from the relevant departments to support us on this uh, path. Uh, nice uh, milestones are good to be celebrated, like you know, approving, uh, getting the GMP approval, ap applying for a registration, getting the registration, getting the first order. All these things or small wins are nice to be celebrated when they happen. So. It's, uh, in my experience, has shown to be good to uh, appeal to those colleagues who are in for the learning experience, who like to go and face the new challenges. So in this case, um, uh, such, such individuals is good to have in the organization. Uh, define the uh, success ma uh, matrix. When is it time to, uh, when is it time to celebrate the success? When is it time to maybe modify the strategy? or when is the time to pull the plug and uh, stop the project? Uh, and finally, uh, how does this new project fit in our uh, uh, landscape? How are we going to, uh, uh, to, to have this project within our company? Uh, criteria for business model uh, and is very important in the sense that uh, choosing a wrong or inadequate business model can hinder the expansion plans and derail our growth, but most importantly, it can fail to capture the potential value and waste companies' energy, time, and resources. Uh, I'm an economist by profession, so for me it was uh, really uh, a discovery in high school when I started to like economics, when I understood the concept of, of opportunity cost. So uh, taking one opportunity and what is the cost of the other opportunity in the sense uh, uh, as a value, uh, so when deciding on a, on a business model, if we go with a business model that is going to waste our resources, it kills the energy for the project in the future. Within the company also, uh, it brings the negative energy and uh, it, it kind of uh, de demoralizes everybody in the, in the process of going to the new market. Uh, so there are different business models and we don't do distribution. We don't do sales to, to the pharmacies and to the hospitals. Most of the, most of the uh, models revolve around uh, regulatory and uh, around promotion. So in terms of the regulatory, uh, when we do all the registration uh, uh, regulatory affair processes, it starts maybe whether in the country you need to have a legal entity to be the marketing authorization holder. Uh, so this process, you do, uh, we as a company do ourselves and we do it in the places where we have our own offices and our teams. We can agree with uh, our partner there to uh, host the host the uh, the, the re registration process. Uh, they coordinate, so we still have to uh, uh, compile the CTD for, uh, uh, dossier for them. We have to uh, sign the dossiers, but they do the submissions. They pay the fees in that market, and sometimes we decide for such a model where we don't want to have a, a, a regulatory affairs personnel in that territory. And finally, uh, the model where the partner, the local partner does all the process, uh, we just do the, what we have to do, CPP sourcing and sample shipping, and of course, uh, compiling the CTD file. Uh, in the promotion business model, uh, Again, 
when we do, and we have our own representative office and our own uh, team on the ground, uh, we hire all the personnel and we handle all the promotion in the market. Uh, when we agree with the local company just to, uh, when we don't want to establish a legal entity or for business reasons, we, we don't do that. Uh, they uh, do the payroll, they do the hiring of the, of the field force. However, we still uh, follow up on the sales planning. We still um, uh, provide the tra training and training the trainer and also the product knowledge. And of course, uh, in the last model where we uh, have the contractual sale force or field force, the local partner does all the promotion. We still have to position the product and val validate the promotional materials. So uh, finally, the overriding question in the go-to-market strategy is how we will, how what we would do is offering and creating value in the patient treatment and in the value chain. The patients have health problems and seek treatment from the healthcare providers. We are on the other end and we have products which have unique features and medical benefits that help patients overcome their problems in a way that is proven to be more effective. The key and most challenging for us is to find the right business model that is more adapt to our capacity and resources. In markets which have shown to be closer to our, say, traditional markets, we are more inclined to establish our own teams, while in different markets or the distant markets, uh, we opt for other business models. Uh, the unique products distinguish ourselves from other producers, and success in our markets has risen confidence in our products and our ability proving ourselves to be a reliable partner and a company that is generating value at every step of the value chain. And thank you for your attention. Ekram, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Uh, and I mean, it's uh, quite detailed and I think it's a, a good roadmap for all pharma companies, how to design and define their strategies for, from go-to-market perspective. So we are quite over time. So uh, I, I just want to ask Christina if there is any question because I cannot see if there's any question coming from the participants personally. All right, so I have one question finally before we end the session. So, I mean, we discussed internationalization, uh, go-to-market models, and uh, also in the first presentation, uh, basically what, um, touch base on the licensing uh, part. So as we are all BD uh, colleagues, uh, I want to hear from your side, uh, Rua, what are the common challenges uh, for uh, licensing for the pharma companies? Well, I can, I, can, I can answer that. The main challenge on the licensing is really uh, to find the right partner. Okay, so uh, as I said, the licensing is a very good complement to the internationalization strategy, irrespectively of how the company is aiming to that uh, to that internationalization to happen. So let's say let's take the example of, of uh, Hecarim or any other company that is wanting to enter on a certain market um, with their own products. The licensing is always a very interesting strategy to allow them to explore niches of those markets to take advantages from as, as we were saying brands as brand expansion as uh, exploring products that could be protected by patents or even um, as Ekron was saying for example one of their strategy is to enter the US market but they don't have a US FDA uh, approved facility so it could be a way to enter the US market even before they got it so the licensing is really a good complement irrespectively of the of the strategy that the company has um, but the main challenge, again, is really to find the right partner and to find a partner in which you trust because the licensing requires a high level of coordination between the partner that, that is licensing the product and the partner that is licensing out the product because you want, if you are licensing a certain technology, you want your partner to be the best partner to actually handle that technology. Let's say that you are licensing a brand, you want the partner to behave and to develop the brand according to what you have imagined and strategize for that for that brand. So that's probably the biggest challenge is, is like trusting one of your biggest assets to another company. So you need to trust them and you need to choose them carefully. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Christina, as I cannot see if there is any question from there. Hi. 
Yes. Uh, so, yes. Uh, it's Juliana speaking. I would like to have a question for Cam. Can is that the right? John. John, yeah, I, I, I missed this part where he was uh, educating us on his name. So, John, the question for, for you would be on uh, maybe two questions from my side. One is on your strategy to export from Turkey to Saudi. So how are you looking this, uh, to these uh, on the perspective on the Saudi Saudization and localization that is very strong in Saudi? And the second question will be on the OM Pharma. So now one year after the acquisition, how do you see this really, really building your pipeline? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think everybody can hear me on this one. Uh, I did not mention about uh, Saudi or the expansion in Middle East really that much, but uh, I briefly mentioned about Europe. Uh, I briefly mentioned about Germany, but uh, as also uh, one building block of our expansion, um, Saudi is also the other building block. Germany is one building block of our expansion and Saudi was a another building block uh, of our expansion. In fact, uh, Saudi was always uh, in Abdi Ibrahim's core strategy, but uh, in the previous years, uh, the expansion could not be formed uh, as a uh, planned, let's put it that way. But this time, uh, I think we found the right model. Uh, so starting from 2022, uh, we are also uh, starting the operation uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, under the umbrella of Abdi Ibrahim. Uh, we have a local partner. And as you rightly uh, mentioned in your question, uh, we will be doing some packaging uh, initially in Saudi Arabia, uh, because that's what we see a critical element uh, for the entry to the Saudi Arabian market. Uh, and we will be doing that with a partner, especially in some certain markets. Uh, as a company, we believe that we uh, earn a lot or we get a lot from uh, joint ventures or alliances. Uh, and uh, when you look at Abdi's history, uh, Abdi grew uh, quite exponentially uh, with the assistance of its partners or with hand-in-hand uh, in, hand in its partners' alliances. Uh, so in Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, we will start our activities under Abdi Ibrahim uh, starting from 2022. And the second question was related to uh, OM Pharma. Uh, OM Pharma at this point, um, we are we created an internal group. Uh, so we are looking for venues that we can collaborate and then we can use our synergies. I think um, a lot of you guys in the audience or listening will agree that uh, there is usually a, pro a stage where the two companies understand their core competencies and how they can contribute to each other. Uh, and this usually starts with some of the manufacturing and then the portfolio and then those kind of activities. So we are really in the initial stages of um, like putting everything on the table and see how we can contribute in terms of cost, in terms of expansion. Uh, and I think the creating this strategy and using I mean, or using the synergies uh, will uh, start uh, afterwards uh, 22 and, uh, and on the onwards. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And uh, Krishna, if we don't have any other question uh, from the participants, I mean, I will uh, pass it to you. Thank you so much, everyone. John, Eklamua, a great presentation. It was a wonderful session.